All right, coaches, it's 7 o'clock, so I'm going to give it a couple more minutes just to let a couple more people uh, filter in. But uh, today's talk is going to be about the high jump. Uh, primary examples I'm going to be using are with uh, my, my female high jumpers just because that's just who I had pictures of. Just made it a little bit easier. Um, and, yeah, so just hang out. I'm going to have a presentation that I'm going to be sending out as well after. I'll probably have Ron. Uh, send it out and uh, it's got a couple of resources in it that are ones that I could use. So yeah, just you know, hang out for a minute. We'll give it, you know, another minute or two and then I'll get started. Everybody see that screen? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right. Perfect. We'll get this thing started. So just for anybody that doesn't know, uh, I am Connor Green. I am the uh, head girls coach at Southington High School. I've been with Southington for my eighth year, uh, cross country and track and everything like that. Uh, and I've been uh, coaching every event we've got. So uh, over the past couple of years, I've worked primarily with sprinters and jumpers. This year, I've uh, been picking up all the throwing events. Um, but high jump is has always been one of my favorite events. I've been fortunate enough to have you know so, some pretty decent ones as, as far as I would be you know, concerned. Uh, and this is, this is what I've learned from him. So today we're going to talk about how to identify different high jumpers. Uh, you know, it's more than just seeing which kid can jump the highest. You know, you'll, you'll have kids coming from a bunch of different sports, obviously for, you know, indoor and outdoor. And you would like to assume that, you know, every kid that comes from basketball or volleyball or sports that have this explosive vertical are also going to be great high jumpers for you. Uh, but it isn't always the case. Uh, so what we're going to figure out is, one, how to identify it, two, the different types of high jumpers that there are, and then basically the, the little things that can make a big difference in terms of competition and what is you know, going to help your kids the most over time. So we're talking about what to look for uh, when finding your next high jumper. So height is obviously a factor. If, you know, I'm going to be referencing um, three of my jumpers. Uh, two of them have just graduated last year, and one of them was uh, Sydney Garrison. She was our uh, New England champ this year. Uh, height is obviously going to be a factor. Somebody that is five feet is probably not going to do great in high jump uh, unless, you know, their hip height is the majority of their body. Because really the main goal of high jump, yes, is to clear the bar, but hip height is probably the most critical factor in that. So I've actually had multiple high jumpers uh, of varying heights, but their hip length and like that starting point are, are all the same. Uh, and that, that can be, you know, pretty, pretty critical up into a certain, certain height. I would say that probably the, the highest some of these kids can get um, specifically that I've seen is if they're, if they're about five, five, four, um, getting them to five feet is, is, is doable. Uh, but they, they need to have a lot of power and a lot of strength to be able to do that. Um, after that, it's, 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 it's pretty tough. Uh, so limb length is going to be more important than overall height, but, uh, you know, height is obviously going to be an important factor. Um, strength and power, obviously when we're talking that, uh, one of the biggest challenges is that, a lot of coaches don't have access to weight rooms and if they do have access, it's in very limited amounts of time or they've got to rotate, you know, 80, 100 kids through that weight room process and they can't necessarily get the training that they're looking for. So I know when it comes to certain programs, you may be the only coach doing the jumps, sprints and the hurdles all at once. So ensuring that you're getting the most out of that work developing strength, developing power, and overwhelming building that explosiveness, that, that's the key. And then flexibility and range of motion uh, is an area that is really under addressed. So you want to make sure that these kids aren't as stiff as a board because going over that bar, you know, we're not for a, a, a huge curve at the back, but we are also not looking for somebody that's going to be as rigid as a board because when it comes to – getting their body in the correct positions flexibility is obviously going to be really important and this is one of the few events um outside of probably the where body position is is pretty critical the thing is that you maintain the social distancing guidelines that have been 
laid out. And I think that that's exactly what Second, just got some people coming in. All right, so when we're talking about how to identify, um, I don't know what kind of testing a lot of coaches do. We typically do or like try to stay within the same area of testing each season just so we can have consistent data all the way through. Uh, it may be adjusted based on the, you know, the weather conditions outside, indoor, outdoor track, things like that. But we're, we're always trying to look for ways to identify uh, horizontal uh, power, vertical power, if it's static, so if they're in a static position, so they're going just a broad jump, or if they're doing a, what I would consider a reactive power. So they're having the ability to, you know, go from standing position, jump, land, reload as quickly as possible, and just be explosive. So we do a triple hop. We do uh, double legs and single legs, just because we're trying to identify, you know, where these kids' strengths are, where their weaknesses are. And we do that for the majority of people. Um, all new athletes go through all of our testing. And then if they were a varsity athlete in certain events and they would like to do it, then they're given the opportunity. But we don't, we don't force them into it. Uh, I have done vertical jump testing in the past uh, using the, uh, the Vertex, but it, it really didn't pan out. Um, we had kids that you know, had, had really great verticals, but it was just because their, their limb length, you know, their arm lengths were really long. And they did not translate into, into good high jumpers. They really just couldn't handle uh, the curve running and things like that. And then uh, we do a 10-meter fly where for my field events specifically, for, this, uh, for the jumpers and stuff, I find this is probably one of my most critical uh, testing events because of the, you know, it's them at their maximum speed. So a lot of the time, especially in high jump, you know, they're not reaching a max speed, uh, but long jump, triple jump, things like that, you know, they, they do. It's, it's, that, it's that takeoff that we're trying to really focus on and just seeing if they can even generate that much force or that much speed over, you know, a short amount of time. That, that's what we're looking for there. So these are some different testing things you can, you can look for. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's not on here just because the idea of actually doing it would probably be more of a challenge than you'd be willing to put up with, but Achilles tendon length is actually a huge indicator of uh, high jump success. Uh, so I forget what book it was that I was reading. Uh, and it was talking about different studies that they've done over some of the world's best high jumpers. And basically what they all had in common was the attachment point from their gastroc or their calf all the way down to their heel uh, was, was really long. And what that tends to mean is that it's going to be like a piston, right? So the longer it is, the more force it's going to be able to generate. Uh, and that's just something that I've, I've actually, after reading it, uh, in I think it was a sports gene was the book it was. Uh, it, I went back and I looked at all my high jumpers and it, it fit, you know, it's, it's something that it, it really does make sense. You know, the body's mechanics work in that specific way. So, you know, if you have the ability or the time, uh, then, just want to make sure that, you know, you can look at it. So it's just more of a fun fact. And obviously there is going to be a Q and a at the very end of this. So if anybody has any questions, uh, like I said, I'm going to be sending, sending all this out as well. So what I want to do is I want to identify three different high jumpers. So these are, like I said, the, my three high jumpers from last year. Uh, we have on the left, Allie Brown. She's actually working as uh, an assistant coach for us now, helping with high jump. Uh, but she came from a dancing background. So uh, an area where you know, being explosive, being quick it, is still a very important thing. She was a 402 meter uh, runner for us and a relay runner. You know, she ran like a 60 for the 400. So she has you know, good speed, good endurance, uh, but she was very injury prone. Um, she never did strength training with us. We would try, she would do band work and everything like that. And uh, she actually was competing at central uh, and was un unable to continue because of a hip fracture that just like would not heal. Uh, her PR was five, three for high jump. And she was about five, seven. Then we have in the middle, we have Sydney. Uh, she was, she's currently our senior. She is five ten, And I feel like every single time I see her, she probably gets a little bit taller. Uh, I would not be surprised if by the end of next year, she was over six feet. Uh, she comes from a volleyball background. She still, she played volleyball at the high school for two years. And then uh, she actually got an infection in her spine and missed the majority of her junior year. Uh, but 
she comes from a volleyball background, so she actually still continued to play for an AAU team. Uh, she does all three jumps for us, and she only started lifting seriously with me for probably about a year, year and a half ago. And when I say serious, I mean like on regular intervals. Uh, she still probably wouldn't be able to deadlift more than, you know, 75 pounds just because of some limitations with her back. Squatting probably could maybe do like a quarter of her body weight. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to be crazy, crazy heavy in order to develop a lot of power. Uh, and then our last one on the right, she was the shortest of the bunch at 5'6", honestly, maybe 5'5". Five, five. Uh, and this is Amanda Brocky. So she had a dance background, but never did any athletics uh, prior to track and field. She did all three jumps for us, and she was about a five-foot high jumper. Um, so the reason I brought these three examples of high jumpers up is because all three of them, like I had mentioned before, they had the exact same hip height. So Sydney standing at 5'10", and then these two other girls standing at 5'6", five, 5'7", five, their hips lined up perfectly. Uh, and it just goes to show that, you know, it, it, it's not always about the vertical, the vertical height that we're looking for. And because they were all three of them were different types of jumpers. So, uh, the ability to identify what type of jumper you're dealing with goes back to some of that testing that we were looking at. You know, if there's somebody who you know, absolutely crushes the, uh, the broad jump or the triple hop and their fly 10 is, you know, like absolutely horrendously slow they're probably not going to be what we consider a speed jumper. They're probably going to be somebody that's more of a power jumper. That was Amanda here. So Amanda was one of our shorter ones. She was somebody that typically, you know, she, she had good turnover, you know, good form and everything like that, but she wasn't somebody that we'd be like, you know what, we, we need an extra leg for the four by one. Let's throw you in there. Um, she would score middle, maybe even below average for a lot of our sprinting tests. And where she really shined was, uh, the ability to generate power from shorter marks. So for high jump, what we did for her is her mark was a lot shorter for long jump, triple jump. She would start further back or uh, closer than everybody because her ability to really just get the most out of all of her, um, all of her takeoffs was, was her strength. So she was somebody we considered a power jumper. Then we had Sydney. Sydney's a speed jumper. So she had the has the ability to run like a 43 44 for the 300 uh she was actually going to be she was our best hurdler uh for a while and then she hurt her back so we we, we took that away and just kept her in high jump <clears throat> and uh after that you know we really found out that we could really move her mark back and her ability to generate and gain speed kind of right as she transitioned into the curve was was critical and that was really where her strengths uh really start to improve. So we do a lot of, a lot of work with her in terms of sprinting, uh, a lot of curve running where, you know, S, different types of drills, like an S drill, or we'll put her on the infield. Uh, and it's one of those things where we constantly, if not every day, we do some type of speed with her. Uh, it was probably every other day at, at best. And then we had somebody like Allie. So Allie was what I consider a hybrid athlete. So she, she was fast, you know, she, she had the speed to back it up, uh, but she was also pretty powerful and pretty explosive where her mark was probably somewhere in between what Sydney's and Amanda's would be. So these would be the three examples of high jumpers who I'm guessing if you, if you start to take a good look at what your, what your current high jumpers are like, this is what you're going to find. And this, this absolutely goes for guys too. Uh, I had an 800 runner who was our best high jumper. Uh, you know, he, he ran too flat in the 800, but he could also triple jump 43 feet. So, you know, having, he's what I would consider a hybrid athlete or a hybrid jumper because he had the ability to be explosive, but he also had the ability to utilize power and speed in different ways. So how did we get the most out of each type of jumper? So if we start with the speed jumper, like I was saying with Sydney, then, you know, they need their mark a little bit further back because in order, just like in long jump and triple jump, in order for them to, to really gain some top speed, we want to make sure that they have the ability to get the most out of their jumps, right? So if you're starting them off on a short mark, even if, you know, they could be a sprinter that has just transitioned over, um, you know, they're not going to be able to get the most out of the, the curve there. And what happens is when they start to go slow, uh, believe it or not, their form can actually break down uh, a little bit more than if they were just, you know, treating it like they were doing a regular approach. One of the challenges that I've had with some of my speed jumpers as well is they tend to be not necessarily as injury prone, uh, but they are very weak in their hips, 
knees and ankles. So because they don't come from sports or uh, previous backgrounds where they've got lots of power developing or even sports where it's like change of direction is a really important thing. So if you get somebody, you know, volleyball, soccer, football, things like that, they have the ability to, you know, once they get onto that curve, you're now putting a lot of force onto their, onto these weakened joints. And if you're not actively trying to strengthen them, they could roll their ankle when they go on the curve, they could, you know, move their body in a position where it, and we'll talk about positions on the curve as well later, but uh, where they basically lose the ability to maintain the correct posture and they then can't load and explode as they go up towards the bar. Plyometrics need to be gradual with them. So you can't just say, all right, we're going to do, you know, hurdle hops, here we go, and just put them up over uh, some advanced plyometric drills because a lot of times with these speed jumpers, uh, they, they tend to be long-limbed and they also tend to be I don't want to use the word frail because frail makes it seem like they're not, you know, athletes, but they, they don't have the ability to absor absorb force at the same rate or the same ability as some of these power jumpers. So it's just something to keep in mind. You know, you want to, you want to really work from the bottom up, strengthen those feet, strengthen those ankles, knees, hips, and that's how you'll advance uh, the plyometrics. And then obviously, like I said, keep up their speed work. You want to make sure that they're doing workouts with sprinters, because they could be some of these athletes that are doing other events like the hurdles, like the hundred. Um, you know, I, I, I see Justin's on here, you know, Tess Stapleton, she was, she was a, you know, five, four high jumper and, you know, the number one hurdler in New England. So, you know, it's, it's important to really make sure that you keep up their speed because that's going to be their X factor when it comes to higher level competition, because if they don't have the ability to, keep their mark consistent because they're constantly changing their speeds, just like in long jump and triple jump, then they're, they're never going to find success. Then we have our power jumpers. Okay. So power jumpers, you can have a little bit of a closer mark. A greater focus should be put on actually being able to maintain body position on the curve and then utilizing their strength and their power with their penultimate jump. Uh, so, well, once again, like I said, we'll talk about the uh, on the curve mechanics and things like that a little later, but the closer mark can actually be beneficial for them. And I've, I've had guys that have cleared six, four from, you know, maybe 40 feet back just because they have the ability to really lower and extend uh, their knees and hips to the point that they generated a lot of power. And it was, it was great. Plyometrics can be more advanced based on their training age. So, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend somebody that's coming in as a freshman even if they, you know, look like that, you know, they could be a defensive back for the football team or something like that, you know, they're still young. So you want to obviously progress them in a way that's going to be beneficial, but you know, they may be able to handle a little bit higher, a little bit more intense of a workload uh, and then keep up their speed work as well, because you know, for, for all these jumpers and everybody in track speed, speed matters. Uh, and then our, our hybrid athletes are, are what we're going to get in between. All right. So when we're talking about actually getting our mark and everything like that, um, I can't take credit for this at all. Uh, Boo Chesnard, if anybody doesn't know who he is, he's like one of the most legendary jumps coaches in the world. Uh, speed and power is, is his, his niche. And I've been fortunate enough to hear him talk at a couple of lectures and actually uh, I email back and forth with him pretty regularly. Um, and he actually responds, which is always a plus because he's got a lot more things to do than listen to me talk about, you know, high jump and stuff. But this is a really easy way. Uh, if you're somebody who's new to coaching the high jump or, you know, you don't have a lot of time and you're fortunate and you've got a bunch of athletes, making a grid system can actually be very beneficial when first starting out because what it does is it just gives kids a general idea of about where they should be in relative to, uh, to, the, to the bar, where their curve might potentially be setting up. And it's just also easy for you to kind of keep track up instead of having kids trying to get their marks every day, every day, every day. Uh, I don't know about other coaches out there, but we have a, uh, you know, where the high jump apron is. If we leave tape marks out, kids in PE will take them up. Uh, so this just makes it a little bit easier at the beginning of every season to um, set it up. So what you do is you take whatever their goal height is. Their measurement out is going to be their goal height and feet times two. So you go about 10 feet out. Okay. Uh, and then you're going to do the same thing going back goal height in feet times 10. So that's a 50. 
Um, you know, obviously this is not an exact science. This is going to be very unique to whatever athlete you're going to be dealing with. Um, you know, when I'm talking about Sydney, she, hers is 12 and a half back and then 50 or 12 and a half out and then 57 back. Uh, but like I said, she's almost six feet tall. So the taller they get and the higher up they're going to go, you're going to want to go further out and further back. So, you know, she's going about seven, seven inches further out. So for her to be at, you know, that 11, six to 12, six range isn't, isn't crazy. Um, I think she would be fine if she went to 12, but she was adamant that she wanted to go 12, six. So it's more about just letting her mental uh, state kind of rest where it is there. So she doesn't have to worry about it too much. Uh, like I said, you can take time, make a grid so that your kids can easily find marks because when you're first dealing uh, with new high jumpers, obviously we all want the, the high jumper that's going to be, you know, on the girl's side clearing, you know, five, two, or the guy clearing six, four, things like that. But a lot of times what you get when you first start out is the kids that are trying to just clear, you know, four feet or five feet for the guys and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're setting them up in a way where they can be successful. And, and this grid system really helps because then they see, okay, other kids are at this level with me. I can figure it out, you know, and then you can, if you want to get really fancy, you can, you know, do the chalk lines from, uh, from wherever you need to go to really build in that curve and it can be very helpful. All right. So my experience has taught me that the two most important things for high jump is training the curve and keeping the back flat when traveling over the bar. So starting with training the curve, step counts obviously can vary based on athletes. You know, they can be eight, 10, 12, whatever. Um, uh, Sydney does, 10 or 12, I believe, I think 12, um, you know, 14, if they were, if they were guys that were going into like the six, eight range or even higher. Um, but most, most people probably won't be going that far. And obviously you can have the ability to either, you know, have a nice even split if they prefer to go with an odd number, it doesn't have to be even, but they can go with an odd number. You just want to make sure that their takeoff foot and their, um, their starting approach foot aren't going to be the same because then they would have issues. Uh, but Training the curve is going to be the biggest thing that affects the jump. Uh, I have a couple more slides as we go on that talks about how small little changes to where the curve is. One, you can identify what is going to happen based on their position when they go over or into the bar. Two, you're going to be able to identify very easily what went wrong. Uh, and three, it's probably going to be one of the easiest things to identify because you can literally just look at the athlete, especially if you're standing behind them, like for indoor where the coach's box is, um, you know, just looking at their body position, will tell you everything you need to know. And then keeping the back flat when traveling over the bar. Um, so actually I think Ron took this picture. Um, and this was from conferences, maybe double L's. Uh, but if you look, her back is totally flat. Um, and a lot of the times the, the notion of going over the bar is you want to curve your back as much as possible. And that's actually a, a, not a great idea because what happens when we curve or have excessive curve of the back is the tendency for the head to drop. So the tendency for her head to drop and her chin to go into her chest is going to cause uh, a reaction in her lower body. And what's going to happen is as soon as that head goes down and towards her chest, her hips are going to drop. So if you've ever had an athlete that always hits the bar with their calves, what's happening is they're probably either overextending at their back, like hyperextending at their back, or they're dropping their chin as they come over the bar. And when they drop their chin as they come over the bar, it's typically because they want to look to see if they cleared the bar. Uh, and for the longest time, Sydney would get out at these heights and it would always be because she would hit like right above her sock line and we couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. And then, um, I, I emailed boo and I said, Hey, can you look at some of these videos? And he said, Oh, without a doubt, it's, she drops her chin every single time, you know, and the second he said it, I couldn't not see it anymore. Um, so it's just, these are two probably the biggest things that I would work on with your advanced high jumpers, your beginning high jumpers, you know, you don't need to do tons and tons of, you know, uh, over the bar drills, because as long as you can get their position correct on the curve, going over the bar is, is the easy part. Everything is all about the approach for high jump. All right. So curve running and what to look for. So for the straight approach, obviously we're going to treat it just like any other 
any other running event, right? We're going to be nice and tall. We're going to be driving those knees out. Uh, but the big challenge becomes how we get onto the curve. And when we get onto the curve, are we maintaining the correct position? So the force of, you know, obviously running on a curved angle is going to make it so it's challenging in the sense that if they don't know how to lean into the curve, then what they're going to do, their, their feet will never be in proper alignment. Their hips are going to be in a position that, you know, kind of looking like this upper body out picture where they're going to be leaning almost towards the bar. And that's just going to throw them into the bar as they try to, you know, maintain that curve and then take off. Uh, they could have a little bit too much of a, a lean where they're at their hips and now they're, you're, they're bending excessively in when we try to give that cue of, you know, you know, stay away from the bar as long as possible. It doesn't mean bend your whole body into lean because we want to see that lean uh, coming from their ankles and their, uh, and their knees, not from, you know, their middle back and, the, and their hips. So obviously we see the top or the third picture here is that optimal lean. What is really critical, and I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm going to go back. Step, hang on. Uh, so when they're on this curve and they actually initiate stepping onto the curve, what they're going to do instead of just, um, just immediate, immediately, immediately at the curve. And what that does is that allows them to position their hips in a way. Uh, that allows them to position their hips in a way. So it looks a little bit more like uh, picture three here with the optimal lean because they're, they're going from a, a linear to a curve and they need to be able to actually turn their hips and align it with that mat so that when they're going to actually take off and then rotate over the bar, now their body's set up in a position to do so. If that makes sense. Also curve running. Uh, the, I, it was really actually hard to find a picture of what, I wanted uh, for the foot position, but you want to make sure that once they're on their curve, their feet are now no longer separate, right? So a lot of times when they're running hip length or uh, hip width apart is how everybody runs. Uh, but when we're actually on a curve, you want that, that left foot to go directly in front of the right foot and stay on that curve. So that's where that, that bending motion actually comes from and that that optimal lean is going to be coming from our ankle. So you want to make sure that they're actually keeping one foot in front of the other. So when we're talking about training the curve and how to, how to do it appropriately and to the best of your ability, making sure that kids understand that is going to be huge. And you think it would be just like <clears throat> co common sense once you tell them like once or twice, but that it, that's not it. Um, arm action as well. So when you're on the curve, tendency to keep everything linear still uh, from you that. You the white flaw. Uh, from that initial, yeah, uh, and it's gonna mute that. Uh, from the initial I have to takeoff point, point, you know, at start, the I'm on camera. We want, hey, Norm, do you mind muting that? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so you want to make sure that they are actually moving their body in a way that's going to allow for maximum speed to ma be maintained and arm action is critical with that. So if we kept our body position and we were going in a linear fashion, so just straight out like we were doing long jump and we just had our arms moving side to side, you know, on our sides, that'd be great. But because we've now introduced the curve, what needs to also happen is the, if you're coming, we'll just assume they're coming from the right. They're, left arm needs to still maintain that that same you know tight to body you know chin back pocket whatever you need but that outside arm so that right arm what's going to happen is if you kept going and your body is now on the curve your arm doesn't realize that unless you're changing it so you need to make that arm now come across the body to ensure that one your body position stays at that optimal lean but two if you don't do that now you've got you know the majority of your body going one way and you've got this limb that's going to influence and pull you towards the bar and the outside of the curve, which is not what you want. So you want to make sure you bring that, that arm across the body. Uh, and, and that's huge because a lot of times when you see kids that get thrown at the bar, one of the main reasons is because their, their body position just isn't in that, in that proper alignment. All right. So examples of some curve running issues. And you know, kind of how to spot them. Uh, the first one is cutting the curve. 
So obviously as coaches, we can't stand directly behind them and we can't get this awesome aerial view of where to look. Um, but what you can see is where they're taking off from, or you can see what their body looks like as it goes into the bar. So you want to make sure that you're getting at least some piece of information from it because if you, if you can't even see the jump, then, you know, just giving them some kind of random cue obviously isn't going to help them, but sometimes that's all we can do. Uh, and for this cutting the curve is where they basically, instead of making it a nice smooth J, they either keep that line straight and cut over, or basically their curve doesn't even start. So it literally could just be, you know, kind of like a, like a weird L a little bit closer to figure six here. Um, and it's, it's very, very common for that. So if your kids don't know how to run on a curve, this is what you're going to get nine times out of 10. Um, I've had a lot of basketball players come with this because when they are taught how to do layups and things like that, this is a very similar, uh, approach run to how you would do a layup, you know, you're, you're cutting and now you're heading to the basket. Um, so it's just something where focusing on how to run on the curve, how to get your feet in alignment, one foot in front of the other can make a really big difference. Another really, really big issue and probably the most common one uh, for, you know, advanced high jumpers of all ages uh, is stepping out of the curve. This is where basically they have the ability to maintain the curve almost all the way through. They're getting to their penultimate step and then they step wide for whatever reason they step wide and then they go for their takeoff. And when they go for their takeoff, now they're a little bit closer to the mat than what they wanted. And when they're too close to the mat, a bunch of things obviously can happen. You know, they're going to be too close to the bar. They're going to be more likely to hit the mat with their heels as they're coming up for their jump. Uh, and you want to make sure that they're aware of it. So Sydney during her sophomore year did this constantly, like constantly. And she had no idea she was doing it until I actually filmed her at practice from like three different angles. And she was like, oh yeah, I, I am stepping out. You know, all our kids learn in very different ways. You know, we can tell them something a hundred times, but until they see it for themselves, they may not really be able to understand it. And once they do feel what that correct position is like, you know, where they really maintain the curve and they're pushing their feet kind of away from uh, the outside of the curve as much as possible, it, it really makes a big difference. So like it says, many jumpers will step on the inside of the curve at takeoff and some do both. All right, so example of over the bar issues. So if your kid is falling on the bar uh, at the, in the beginning of the flight, you know, there's, there's sitting on the bar, there's falling on the bar, and then there's jumping into the bar. Falling on the bar is really, really obvious. So it's basically they jump up and it's like, okay, they didn't go anywhere. They literally just fall, their, their middle of their back lands directly on the bar. Not safe, doesn't feel good. They're gonna talk about how much it hurts for a long time. Uh, most likely what's happening is the curve has been flattened. So instead of them being able to maintain that curve, they probably either stepped out somewhere or they, you know, made a beeline for the mat and lost all of that, all of that speed that is kept when being on the curve in the proper position. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you may want to check on how wide out they are or how far back they are, because, you know, if you kind of just let them wing it and don't actually have some measurement for it, they're going to have trouble with it. Um, I have a, I have a boy who he hates getting marks. He's like, I'll, I'll just figure it out. And he falls on the bar all the time. Um, but he's a pole vaulter. So he, he's a little bit crazy to begin with. Uh, then we've got sitting on the bar. This is a really, really obvious position. Um, and I'm, it's where, they, they literally look like they're sitting in a chair. So their body doesn't even get horizontal at this point. Um, the, like it says, the natural tendency is to work harder on arching their back and you can't really do it. The second you're in the air, you, you've lost all control. Really. The only things you can control are like your fingertips and like your head position and maybe, maybe point your toes up. But the whole like arching your back or moving your hips, you know, or pulling your knees up a little bit higher, a lot of that it isn't really done in the air. A lot of it is done prior to that in the approach. So if your kids are basically getting thrown 
at the bar and, the, and they're not even getting horizontal with it, you may want to look at how, you know, how much they are actually staying on the curve. And if they are leaning towards the bar, that's most likely what's happening because when you're on the curve, you want to be leaning or keep that, that inside shoulder as far away from the bar as possible. So they may be just a little bit too tall going into, into the bar there. The last one is jumping into the bar. Uh, so this is a common thing that happens with most, most high jumpers, especially if they've moved up to a new height. Um, and you want to coach them to, you know, jump higher or, you know, drive their knee up a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's not always the case though of them not jumping high enough. Once again, it comes back to the curve. Okay. So if they're misaligned as they're coming off the curve in, and when I say misaligned, I mean, if they're, if their hips aren't tilted to allow them to, you know, maintain that curve speed and they're just a little bit too upright, the, the force of traveling on the curve is just going to throw their body at it. And if their mark is too far away, uh, and when I say too far away, I mean, you know, if you're standing, you know, an arm's length away from the bar coming out, you know, if they're even further than that, then they're a hundred percent and not going to be able to maintain that speed because now their body position is not correct. Uh, they are too upright. So if you know, it says the jumper's hips must pass directly over the takeoff foot during takeoff. Um, if they're standing directly upright, the foot's going to be underneath the hip. It won't even have an opportunity to travel over the hip or over the foot. Um, so you want to make sure that hip position off the curve in the penultimate is, is done. And when we look at the curves, stepping out of the curve is basically where you lose a lot of that. All right. So curve running, like I said, super important. This is the only drill I feel that you really need in order to get your kids to understand and feel what it's like uh, to be in a position going over the bar. Um, so in the video, the, the coach does it where the athlete is on the ground. We've done it that way, but we also do it where the athlete is standing on the mat uh, and then they're falling and landing in this position that I'm going to show you. Uh, just because it gets kids used to like the actual act of falling um, you know, in high jump and pole vault were the only events where, you know, kids need to be aware that they're going to fall and the higher they get, the, the further they're going to fall. Let's show what this drill looks like. So if you'll notice right here, um, his knees, when he started that, that initial uh, drill, he pushed his knees forward. And what that does is it basically forces your hips to come back in a way that is going to set you up a little bit more. So see how his knees went forward and it pushed his hips up and back. And what that does is it puts that back in a beautiful posture because if he was going over the bar that, that, you know, that's the ideal posture that we're looking for and having his toes up. What he's doing is he's basically forcefully extending now through his toes, ankles, knees, hips, and it keeps his hips up from dropping. So you won't get that chair position. You won't get your, your butt hitting the bar. And the last thing I want you to look at is his head, right? So he's there, he's there, he's driving that up. Everything looks good. He's not dropping his chin or anything like that. These are critical positions that your kids need to understand what they feel like. Because if they can't feel it, they won't be able to perform it. doesn't matter how many times you cue it. Um, they need to get comfortable doing it. And it's a really, really easy drill for multiple kids to do. You can literally set them up all the way around the mat, have them take turns doing it. You know, it's something that's fun and easy to do. And you don't have to have them standing, you know, with a bungee where they're doing, you know, they're looking behind their back and they're, and they're jumping over the bar where you can only get one, maybe two kids at a time doing that. So it's a really good time-saving drill as well that teaches them what to feel when they go over the bar. All right, so some resources that I've utilized that have you know, really, really changed my life in terms of high jumping, or all jumping events, to be honest. Uh, CompleteTrackandField.com, 
Uh, Latif does an amazing job of collecting as much information uh, and videos and presentations from other coaches, uh, like elite coaches, and just puts all that stuff up there. Uh, and then uh, sacspeed.com, that's Boo's actual website. Um, and basically, you can get a lot of the videos on complete track and field.com on sacspeed. Uh, but what you can also get is the ability to communicate with him and email him. And he, he emails back pretty pretty quickly, like within, you know, 48 hours. And this is a guy who's, you know, traveling all over the world, giving conferences and stuff. Um, he, he's looked at videos. He, you know, does detailed responses and stuff like that. So I would highly, highly recommend, um, you know, be willing to ask questions, send them videos. If you are unsure about something, you know, ask, ask people that are way smarter. I, I only know things because of what they've taught me. Uh, so just like every coach, you know, we unless we're you know really revolutionary and creating our own material uh you know we're just we're taking from the best and doing the best we can with it so all right so i will open open it up to questions any and all questions hey connor it's ron knapp yep hey ron hey uh thanks for the uh, great presentation i just wanted to, before you get going with uh questions and then answers I just wanted to let you know uh, and the people on board that uh, I've signed up Kazlock some from Greenwich for a uh, for, for a session next Thursday. Uh, details will be published, but it will be about mid middle distance training and a competition. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Connor, no uh, can, yep. can you hear me? This is Nick Fraticelli. How are you? Good, Nick. How are you? Good. Um, just have a question um, at Danbury. We kind of work with our high jumpers on the same day when we have, especially during during indoor. It's tough. We have access to um, like a gym floor, but um, mm -hmm. we're working with kids. Some some of the guys are jumping five eight, five ten, and the girls, like a good girl, will jump four ten, five feet. Um, how do you manage that? Like if you, I, I'm assuming you're in the same position working with both oh, yeah. your boys and girls. So to be honest, it, it has been a challenge. Um, I would say that having a bungee is critical. You know, if you're actually able to set up a mat uh, with a bar and everything like that, that's fantastic. Uh, typically, I only do full jumps or um, like jumps where they're really focusing on that stuff maybe once a week. Uh, a lot of what we do is curve running, body position, uh, and, at least for indoor. Uh, because indoor, like, you know, like you said, it's, it's a gym floor, they're in sneakers, it's, it's less than ideal positioning. So a lot of what we work on is S drills and having the ability to actually get comfortable stepping, stepping out of that linear path and actually getting onto the curve. Um, and when it comes to actually doing over the bar things, that's a good day to, uh, and you, you can obviously switch it up as needed, but for, you know, if, if you do have those guys that are going 5'10", you know, it wouldn't be a horrible idea. Maybe set the bungee at, you know, five, four, have them go from a short approach and you could have girls using some kind of box or something like that and teach them, you know, body positioning, going off a box from a higher, a higher bar or, you know, basically even shifting so that you can split it maybe, you know, 30 minutes with one, 30 minutes with the other. Um, and you know, unfortunately, just like every event, we're trying to we're trying to do our best to give all the kids the the most attention we can. Um, I've also had it where we split them up, and you know, I'll work specifically with girls doing over the bar stuff, where it actually utilizes the mat, and then the guys will be doing some kind of like core circuit or you know some kind of plyometric work, and then they flip flop like that as well. Okay, thank you. Yep. Connor, this is Andrew Masters. How you doing, Andrew? Hey, good. Um, just real quick, uh, you had talked about lifting progression for new or beginning athletes, particularly girls. Um, yep. Can you give me some suggestions for that? Yeah, absolutely. So when in doubt, body weight has to be the first thing you start with. Um, we have freshman athletes who you know, are, are more advanced than some college freshmen that I've seen. But it's, it's all about starting at body weight then dumbbells, then barbells. Uh, and honestly, you don't really need to get past dumbbells a lot of times. If it's an equipment need, then yeah, absolutely. Um, if you've got, you know, a football player who is also one of your best jumpers and he's used to lifting heavy and that's great. 
but it's all about bar speed or the speed at which the dumbbells are moving. Um, and you don't have to go crazy heavy. So I'll, I'll use um, Sydney as an example. Like I said, we, we, we didn't lift heavy with her. She's a very long limbed athlete. So having her deadlift from the ground coming all the way up or expecting her to squat and get below 90 degrees, uh, you know, it, it's not realistic, especially given that she's also, you know, she's strong, but not in the sense that she can hold half her body weight in a dumbbell and squat all the way down. Um, so it's all about working with the, the type of athlete you have and making sure that you're taking them through that progression. If they can do a body weight squat, great. Next thing you do, add a dumbbell. Okay. If they can do a dumbbell, add two dumbbells and just make sure you're progressively going through it that way. Because the worst thing that we can do is load them too quickly because what they'll start doing is they'll start getting slower. And that's the last thing you want from a jump. You want them to be explosive. You want them to be able to move through the range of motion quickly. Uh, and especially given the limited amount of time that coaches have with their kids in the weight room, you know, you may get them to do a workout maybe once, maybe twice a week. You know, if we're talking, you having a full strength coach staff and they got in there four days a week for, you know, six months. Okay. No, you're going to want to do, you know, some different type of periodization, but, you know, make the most of what you got. We do maybe four, five exercises, two, maybe three of them are explosive types of exercises. And then they're paired with just regular, you know, hypertrophy exercises to help strengthen their, uh, their major, their major joints. Thank you. Yep. Nobody else. Actually, quick question. Um, yeah. Can we get this uh, PowerPoint from you later on? Yep, I'm, I'm going to send this out uh, directly after this with uh, the recording as well. Okay, well, nobody has any questions. Uh, my email was in the attachment, so please feel free to uh, you know, send, send me a question if you got anything. Um, strength and conditioning wise as well, uh, that, that is my background, so I'd be more than happy to help. Uh, and yeah. Thanks for letting me talk.